Hey, 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 thanks for listening to the Welding Tips and Tricks podcast. I'm here with Roy Crumrine. How's it going? Jonathan Lewis. Hello. And this week we have a special guest. He's on Instagram. He's Raw Iron Choppers. Also, his name is Jesse Serpan. How you doing, Jesse? Good, good. How you guys doing? How's everybody doing? We're doing good. Glad to have you on. Thanks for going to the effort to being on because I know that you're at a cycle show and you're actually in the car, like on your way home. Is that correct? I'm literally hanging out of my truck. So I got a lifted Cummins and pulling a ticket out, going out of Chicago for uh, the turnpike. <laughs> well, cool. Well, well, before we even get into it, can you kind of fill us in on, uh, you know, what the show was, what you do? And we'll, we'll ask a few questions after that to kind of fill in some of the gaps, but kind of fill us in, kind of, you know, fill in the gaps on the, what this show is all about and what you're all about. Yeah, man. So, uh, you know, one, one thing what we do here, you know, over at Raw Iron is it's kind of, kind of a big mutt. Uh, it started out 2003 kind of as a hobby. And I said, you know, I want to get a welder and got the whole inspiration of getting a little, well, I think it was a Lincoln little LN or SP 135 uh, little like hobby MIG welders. And I said, man, I want to learn how to weld one day. And it was kind of all started from the monster garage stuff and seeing Jesse James on TV and kind of always like that. You could, you could make a living and make stuff with, you know, two pieces of material and weld them together like metal glue. And, uh, went out when I was 13 and bought my first MIG welder. And, you know, my, my dad goes, what are you doing with all your money? I go, I'm going to buy a MIG welder. He's like, well, Oh, okay. You know, whatever you want to do, man. You know, not typically what a, a kid at 13 would buy and started chopping up mini bikes and all that stuff. And then we entered a mini bike into a show, just kind of a little, you know, chintzy one and kind of got really serious from there. We got, you know, kind of looking into designs and, you know, just saw the, the creativity of what I wanted to do and produce. And, you know, it wasn't until I was about 18. I said, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to start a, a chopper company. I'm going to start this, but I'm going to weld. So, between that phase at, at 15, I, I went and took a vocational class with a good friend of mine, Ryan Eubank, who is a, an instructor over at Lincoln Electric, also at the community college, Lakeland Community College we work at. And he was really my mentor and, and the guy I got to do a lot with. I got, I got to work with him at EAA Oshkosh, uh, doing all the exhibitions for TIG welding. And it just great guy that taught me as much as he could about welding. And I also worked with Joe Colossa and the great Bill West at the time before he passed away. And it was kind of an honor, you know, so raw iron blossom from all that and learning education and, and, you know, welding. And I just kept pursuing further things, you know, built more bikes, learned and learned and learned. And, you know, I think the one thing I never stopped asking questions and I, if I, I broke and did something wrong, I learned how to do it the right way and ask the right people. So that's kind of where raw iron kept going. And typically right now what we do is anything from kind of mild aerospace, more consulting with, with education on that for some companies. Uh, obviously, you know, teaching at the local community college is a big thing, but, you know, we knock out a, quite a bit of bikes and custom fabrication. So it's kind of where raw iron's kind of blossomed from and kind of pulls me to things like this show now. You know, we just came from Chicago, a championship show, and we won modified Harley and pretty prestigious. You got to be invited. There's about 30 motorcycles. So very, very cool thing we did. So just to kind of let that simmer and sink in to everybody that's listening to this, you just came from a show. What was the name of the show again? The show was uh, it was Chicago international motorcycle show and it's uh an event that travels i think to 12 to 15 different cities across the u.s and they also have a competition inside of it called ultimate builder and they spend good amount of prize money to every show to get you checks and then they invite you to the championship which we just came from and so you entered a bike or or one bike or multiple bikes or or what there we you... we entered multiple that actually won cleveland in a uh freestyle class which is like no holds bar it's whatever you build creativity uh engineering wise and then modified harley which is you kind of have a basic frame uh drivetrain like a harley davidson but you can do anything under the sun to customize it and make it one off so you won that competition the modified harley competition and that's a pretty dang prestigious win i mean any win at any of these shows they're so competitive let's i mean they're so competitive that winning anything is prestigious but to win to win that thing is is just huge you know so anyway i just want to let that sink into everybody i mean you're you're raw iron choppers on instagram i've been following you for a while we we've run into each other at a fab tech or two or three and uh, you, you've been repping different brands like you know some abrasive companies and things like that at fab techs when i've run into you 
but you know, to win anything at a at a motorcycle show like that, it means you you know you you're bringing you're bringing something to the table if you win anything because it is so competitive, ultra competitive. Just so kudos, congratulations for that, Thank Jesse. Thank you. Thank you. I think every one of us on this podcast, along with every red blooded American dude out there, has followed the you know TV shows for the last fifteen years or so and seen. Uh, Orange County Choppers and Jesse James Monster Garage and who knows what else came along. And I was glued to it for a while until the drama got too much, <laughs> you know, yeah. but I love the shows. But I, it was all, I was just always kind of left hanging because I wanted to learn, you know, I wanted to, well, how did you build that gas tank or how did you build that frame or what fixturing you used for that? How did you line that up? And that, that wasn't what they were about, you know. Exactly. It kind of left me hanging a little bit, and I hated the drama, but I'm going to put my size 11 up your butt, Mikey, and all that <laughs> if you don't clean the shop up. And, you know, I hated that part because I, I just, just, just let's just build a freaking bike here and show us all how what we all want to know, but that's not what those shows were about, unfortunately. I guess that's just a real, the, the you know, I guess maybe they had to do what they had to do to for their viewership. I don't know, but. I always felt like I was left hanging big time, but I don't feel like that when I'm following on your Instagram channel and I'm, you know, seeing the posts that you've made over the several years and, you know, articles in ARC magazine and things like that on how to build a, uh, a gas tank and things like that. So, you know, what's been your experience, how you got started and what's what's your take on all those shows like that? It's it's funny you bring that up, Jody. Um, I, if you guys remember about four years ago, we did a biker build off. It was actually a... Uh, Kind of a, a new spinoff of the old biker butt off. Uh, Hugh King used to be the producer of those shows way back when, and those those really took off well because they were looking for shows that you know produce that real world purse. You know, for the people like us that we we want to see welding, cutting, grinding, no drama. We just want to work, and that was something that when I accepted to do a discovery, I signed my little death warrant away. We we actually did win the show. It was called Biker Live, the Rust Belt Edition, and they picked uh, myself and two other shops to go against each other. We had a uh, five weeks and a twenty thousand dollar budget to do whatever we wanted to do and come up with, and it was it was pretty strange, man. Because I, I remember the biker build offs, and I liked Jesse James because he was you know zero BS. You know, he always did cool stuff and he explained stuff to the best they could for to their viewers with the time allotted. You know, and I was never a huge fan on the other shows that were more drama and all that stuff. And that's kind of where I get a lot of inspiration from the Pope of Welding. You know, and. Uh, yeah, I, I kind of got a lot of that. But when I signed up for TV, it was it was kind of heartbreaking for me and my, my crew when we did it because we built a tank for days on end and we built all the stuff. And they literally told me to my face and said, dude, if we wanted a PBS uh, station, we would have we would have done that. We would have, you know, made that. But this is not about teaching. This is honestly about trial and error and trial and error makes viewership. And honestly, if you can decipher what that means, sounding professional, they want drama. And they said drama sells to the 90% of Americans who don't know what the heck you're doing and the 10% that do want to see it like us, uh, we're not too worried about you, you know, but that's why shows like that kind of fade away over time, you know, but that was kind of disheartening to me when I did do those shows, you know. You know, I'm not surprised to hear that. I, I'm I'm not happy to hear that, but I'm not surprised. You know, we, we've had Jimmy DeResta as a guest on here before, and he's a big mover and shaker in the in the maker movement, you know, just makes stuff. And he he does a little welding and a lot of woodworking and just making stuff. And he was he's been on TV, and his experience with TV is very much like what you just described right there. You know, it's all drama, and you know it, he kind of developed a little chip on his shoulder toward mm -hmm. TV shows, and that's where he went into his own YouTube channel. He's doing great, and uh, and all that, but. Yeah, man, TV's not necessarily the be all end all. You know, it's got a lot of baggage with it. In fact, in fact, that brings up um, a, another guest that we've had on here, um, Ian Johnson from. Um, you know, he was with Extreme Four by Four, made a break with them recently because yeah. of the, that, that kind of stuff. They wanted control over all the content and they, you know, to produce. And he's like, you know, how about we do this? How about I have control? And they're like, no that's not going to work. And he's like, you know what, this ain't going to work. So go pack sand and I'm going to do my own thing. And, uh, you know, he's doing his own thing with the big tire garage thing now, and I'm sure it'll be fine. It'll be probably a lot better for him with a lot more freedom of, you know, having control over content, but old TV thing, man, it just doesn't seem like it's all it's cracked up to be. Exactly. I agree. And that's, I'll tell you one thing that was cool is 
you, you know, you see the massive amount of positive and negative feedback, even through all our social media and the more followers we build, you know, you, you get the wild ones that kind of come out and say really off the wall stuff, you know, and you get anything from the Instagram CWIs all the way to the people that think they've, they've seen more than us, you know, or they don't want to provide <laughs> information, you know, and, uh, <laughs> Instagram CWIs. I like that one. Let's hashtag that, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, yeah. it's undercut, it's, undercut. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. You know, it, it, it blows me away, man, that like when when I did TV, I had a few people that said, hey, you're a complete, you know, pain and we didn't like who you were. It's like you only saw about half hour of me on national television. They, they made this whole perception. But you also had the people that were positive. And, and the coolest thing is I had people that were like, hey, we don't know much about you, but we read into you and we like your positivity and who you are. And you're, at the time, I think I was 23 years old. And they're like, man, you, you just you, you got it going on. You're not a dude talking about money and your next million you're going to make. You're just you love your craft. And they said, I'm signing my kids up for their open house for vocational welding school, or I'm sending them to, over to college for post-secondary welding. And I want those kids to try it. And I, I thought I wanted them to be a doctor, lawyer, and, you know, someone working in, in a field that would be safer and not, you know, as, as rough blue collar. And they said, you've changed our whole mind. And that to me, Jody and guys, that, that really is what blew my mind. I was like, cool, man. If I reached out to five people out of all those viewers and they changed those people's lives, that's what it's all about, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So you are a welding instructor, correct? Yes. And so you teach you teach at a Votech school or that type of environment, as well as do your do your own thing, building building uh, modified bikes and choppers and bikes from scratch, as well as modified bikes. And yep. So you're a pretty busy guy. All the time, man. It's like we just if you guys noticed recently last year, I started throwing in some hot rods and stuff. So I kind of partnered up with a guy who. Once again, we all know you guys have businesses, and I do myself, and trying to do things, and it's hard to find people that are of quality. And he, he kind of reached to me and said, "Hey, do you have a any students, you know, that could be worthy of doing these cars?" And we're talking cars that are between fifty thousand to four hundred thousand dollar vehicles, and it's got to be pristine. And uh, I said, "You know what? What's your hours?" He goes, "Well, six to midnight, two to three days a week." And I just laughed. I go, "I don't know any normal person that part time those hours unless unless they're self employed." So I said, "I'll do that." And I said, so I do that on the days uh, after I'm done teaching over at the, the community college. So it's kind of neat, neat the whole mutt of life I have with welding stuff. I think I think we're all like that. <laughs> yeah. be honest, you know, we kind of piece together a living, a career, a life, whatever you want to call it. But, you know, I mean, if somebody wanted if somebody wanted me to weld on something like that and the hours were from six to midnight, I'd I'd probably say, yeah, let's do it. Uh, it just it just depends on what I was interested in, you know, because if you're a builder, if you're doing a hot rod or a bike or whatever, man, you just can't let just anybody weld that stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you just really can't. I mean, some and it goes it's like it's like a lot of the stuff that uh, the machinists, the machine shops I work for, you know, the, a lot of times they'd have, you know, four thousand dollars or more in machinist man hours in a part. And then they're going to turn it over to a welder. You can't just let anybody weld that because if they kill it, they just ate four grand, you know, exactly. and, and nobody can afford that. So same thing with hot rods or motorcycles or whatever. So you, it's got to be a certain amount of skill level, certain amount of trust in the, your ability to be able to, you know, not only do the part right, but not scrap the part, you know, or vice versa or whatever. But it's a yep. uh, it's a world we live in. So you, you know, the hours come as they come and the, you know, the work comes as it comes and we just kind of filter it in and try to make a life out of it exactly exactly that's that's the one that i tell everyone they go man you you must do good money you know teaching i kind of laugh i go i go it's it's good money to pay your bills a month you know i said it's nothing that's you know going to make you make anywhere near what my my shop pulls in and other places i do work for and i said but let me tell you where the real money's at they go what's that they they kind of always lean forward to me i go when you have 16 people ranging from in their 50s 60s i've even had early 70s because they just want to try it but I got kids that are 15 to 18 years old still in high school, and they took the class, curious, and all of a sudden these kids are almost a graduation. you got them making anywhere from a baseline minimum of 12 to $15 an hour, and they're just getting into something to make some money. And then you got some of the other ones that were you know, working at local you know, gas stations or fast food chains, and they're like, man, I'm almost banging out $20 an hour now, and I'm getting paid to do something I really like. And you couldn't have told me six months ago I'd be welding and having fun, and they – they get that love and that, that whole lust for metal fabrication like we all share. And that, to me, is the biggest thing. And I see that even as an economic growth thing. It's not like I'm changing percentage of the workforce and employment, but I see it as a, a micrometer size of 
just what I'm giving back to society as an instructor and, and providing quality welders. Yeah, man. That just doesn't get old because nope. when when somebody thanks you for uh, this last this last fab tech, I had you know a handful of people that I shook hands with and talked to that that thanked me for those kind of things like you're talking about there. Like, hey, I was doing this and then I wanted to do this, and I watched some of your videos on YouTube and it helped me to pass this test. Then I was able to get a job at the local fab shop near my house where I was able to now watch my kids grow up instead of be out of town. And I just want to thank you for that. You know, how does, how do you, how does that not just make your day? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. man. I think because all of us that are human beings know what it's like to, you know, want to raise a family or want to be with your loved ones or your spouse or your girlfriend or whatever. And if somebody can help you just get to that next level and facilitate that, it's a super, meaningful part of life you know it's what that's what kind of what gives meaning to life in my opinion i don't want to get all philosophical here or anything like that but you know <laughs> yeah that's just that's just what gives meaning to life for me I, i'll tell you what it's funny uh jody is there's two times i've probably really cried i mean like you know, I'll, I'll give it three times it's funny we're, now we're gonna get all sensitive you know we're gonna turn this into like over, let's, over let's do it show. <laughs> but I, I had I had my best friend pass away randomly, and that that was a huge hit, man. I mean, that was like a ton of bricks, and it, it took a lot of recovery. You, you've all probably been through that in different ways. Had a dog pass away. Everybody knows that's the half part. Yeah, that's a rough one, especially a childhood. But the the third one that got me, and it's funny, and I'll, I'll admit it to everybody, so they kind of just know how passionate I am about this. But I I spoke to a school of eighth graders. It was about I think about 150 plus, and I did this in early early December. Just asked. They said, would you donate some time and talk about you know. We want to get people interested in the blue collar trades and different options for graduation. And so they're eighth graders, 13 years old. I talk to them and they're all, you know, they're into it. They're really asking great questions and they're all about it. Time goes by, you know, I do what I do. And, you know, they were really responsive. I get a manila envelope in the mail. Uh, I think it was about two weeks ago. And it says, you know, so-and-so schools to Mr. Serpan of Raw Iron. I'm like, okay. I open this and the first one has a paragraph written, handwritten, you know, back like old school ways, you know. And it wasn't generic, thank you for coming, thank you for your time, blah, blah, blah. They would say, I'm so-and-so, I talked to my parents, and we're buying a welder. Or we're, we're going to look into, you know, uh, vocational school. And they, they gave me detail for detail how it inspired them. And I at least had 60 letters out of 150. And I'm going to tell you what, I had tears to the point I couldn't even, I couldn't even read them out anymore to, to, my, to my family. I said, but this is truly what it's all about when you get to this level and you can give back. And, Jody, that's something you, you've done for a while is, sharing your education you know via via social media and the internet and boy i'll tell you what that third one i i i, I couldn't pick myself up off off the, the chair you know i was just bawling my eyes out you know that's super that must have been a good talk that you had because i've given yeah. a few talks before and i'm looking out there and i'm seeing people check their phones and you know and after the talk there'd be like two or three people that want to ask a few questions afterwards but it just depends on what environment you're in but you must have shared your heart to have oh, that, that that happened that, that's how it is i mean if you've ever met ryan eubank at lincoln he's he's very you know upfront no filter and i'm kind of the same way you guys are friends with me on social media and i i kind of put it out there but i'm i'm, I'm a big teddy bear you know I just and that's that's how i do it you know and i just am honest with people and i think you know when you're in these fields you have to explain the honesty and, and people tell you oh it's going to be fun when you graduate you know high school or college you're you're going to go out there and you're going to work the rest of your life away and get up and have no sleep and then yeah, just get ready, you know. And I'm like, guys, it sucks. This is the reality. This is what we're. This is what you're in for. But you know what? Find what you truly like, or make that next move. And, and don't let someone decide it for you when you're 15 years old. See what you truly like, but but dip your toes in different waters and see what you like, you know. And that to me is what I, I just. The kids responded well because kids nowadays are smarter than even than when we were young, you know. And they're very responsive to stuff, and they they sense when people are lying to them and people are telling them the real deal, you know. Yeah, and pulling yeah. up on a chopper probably helped too. No, you know what? I went, <laughs> yeah. I, I went there honestly with uh, if you guys remember, I did a Bessie Tools video about three years ago. Yeah, and just just shared that. But I, I actually will tell people I'm not taking choppers there because one, they look at it as something you can't attain. They see a lot of money and time. And they go, "There's no way I'll ever do that." So I go there with me because I think it's more real when they just get you because they're kind of in the corner, like Jody said. But they'll. Instead of looking at their phone, they're looking at the bike, and they ask questions. Hey, how fast does it go? Did it blow up if you're wrecked? You know, and I, I want people to just have us one on one, almost like this podcast. You know, well, that's cool. Yeah, yeah, that is so. cool. 
yeah, that's my little rant, so I'll, I'll tone it down. <laughs> <laughs> Keep it going, man. Cool. Well, I remember I remember from running into you at a fab tech, you know, years ago, you were talking about you were talking about an article you did for uh, one of the uh, trade publications of a major manufacturer and all that. And there were some there were some issues that went along with that. I won't go into details, but it just points to the fact that when you involve yourself with sponsors or manufacturers or whatever, there there are um, it's hard to navigate those waters. Yep. Sometimes, you know, I've had I've had my issues and I, I'm kind of like over it, <laughs> to, to yeah. be honest, you know, I'm yeah. just like, you know, I'm figuring out other ways to to make a dollar rather than try to help somebody sell their stuff. You know, if, if, if they want to let me sell their stuff and I think it's good stuff, that's a whole that's a perfect marriage. But if it's just anyway, I'm just kind of over <laughs> the whole sponsorship thing. But I, but I, I do remember you. I do remember talking to you and I, I you know, we've kind of touched base over the years. I know you do things the right way. Mm -hmm. I know you don't shortcut. You don't just do things for fluff and for the for the flash and for the image and for the Instagram post. You know, if if there's a if you're making a gas tank, you're getting full penetration. That thing's not going to leak 30 days later. You know, exactly. And things like that. You're prepping the metal. You're doing, you know, and and that, that actually means a lot to a guy like me, to a guy like Roy, to a guy like Jonathan for us our podcast. We want to talk to somebody that wants to do things the right way for the sake of a job well done, not for the sake of more likes, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's, that's a funny one to jump off of. And I'll use a quick example and make it short as, you know, if you, if you go back to technology with Harley Davidson, and we're talking, you know, thirties, forties, early fifties. Um, they did a lot of braised, you know, brazing on their slip joint frames. And that's all it was. A lot of guys will, try to fix a cracked frame and go, holy cow, this is all brass, bronze, and whatever else may be in there from that time. And it, it makes a huge war with that. And what that war is, is why do I have to be like you guys who, you know, weld on aircraft and nuclear stuff? If I'm going to pay you this rate and this frame has been over here and it's been doing the same thing for 70 years, why are you guys preaching this so bad when this stuff's still holding together? And that that is a battle I see a lot with motorcycle stuff because – at least car stuff, people get it because high performance and drag racing and NASCAR and, and yada, yada, yada. But bike stuff, it's like, well, if I got a coat hanger, tombstone welder, I, I'm just perfectly fine. And I'm not paying you your rate to, you know, have these aircraft quality welds on it. It's like, holy cow, you got the whole idea backwards, you know? Yeah. It's kind of like that uh, pick two shirt I made. It's like, you know, good, fast or cheap. You can only pick two. Exactly. Exactly. Well, how do you fight that battle? I mean, just curious, more details on the on the uh, whole thing you're talking about. So you're talking about some, some joints that were brazed with brass or bronze. And so what what is the what is the argument? What is the battle that, that so, you're talking about there? So the way mine goes with the repair, if, if you get a, a diehard restoration person, they will want it repaired with your typical, you know, silver solder, you know, style slip joint and whatever else may be in those parts, you know. Uh, a lot of old Indian neck stems were that way. They used actually silver solder. They didn't just mm -hmm. cap it at the end and, and run a, you know, a piece of rod around a stick or whatever they had at that time. And that's how that was done. And I've seen one pop out, and the guy was actually okay, but we repaired it the same exact way. He didn't want it any other way besides, you know, silver soldered in. But for restoration, we'll, we'll keep it that same way. But when it comes to the welding part, I basically tell him, hey, man, do people still drive Model Ts everywhere? Or do you want to actually drive around? A newer vehicle and it sounds very basic and very elementary but that's the way i explain it is there are better improved ways of doing things and yeah we can get in the metallurgy side of it but it's like this is where it stands and this is you know tried and true you know and then it, they gets kind of in the talk of fit up how important is your fit up compared to you know people that are trying to braze things still or you know those old frames sometimes they were brazed and they were engineered to be over structural you know they have more gussets more tubing but if you look at a lot of my frames, they're very simple. You know, they're one-piece bends, and I just do a root pass around them, but I will actually bevel and chamfer, and that's where a lot of the argument comes. And so once I get people away from the, oh, those are just pretty welds, and they understand the structural side of it and heat control, you know, and all that stuff, it starts to kind of pull them in a little more. So you almost have to educate the client of what you're doing, and you kind of got to even get them away from the, well, I want you to build a frame because it's got pretty welds. It's like, no, we're, we're going beyond that because of that reason, you know. Yeah, you you mentioned earlier something about Oshkosh. Yep. And did you, you taught classes at Oshkosh. 
Yeah, I taught about, I think it was four or five years, and, and Ryan was one of the people to pull me in with Lon Damon, who used to be in marketing. And uh, it was very, very cool. You know, they, they brought me on, and I think I was 20 years old. And they said, what's this kid know, and this and that? And then, you know, they kind of kind of tested the waters with me, and, you know, it was very cool. We, we taught basic TIG welding, anything from chromoly, you know, tubing for aerospace down to aluminums. And we would actually have about 200 people sit in two different classes a day, and they'd be uh, three-hour classes, and you'd give them demos, and you would actually just, you know, get these people involved with welding, and why do they need a welder in their shop? And, you know, we're talking people with very big money. You know, we're looking at bike week, but with airplanes. And, you know, these people go over there and buy the newest machine, but you would sell that to them. But to us, it wasn't about selling a machine. We wanted them to understand what they were getting into. What did they need at home, and what was the best machine for a hobbyist or someone looking to open a, a business? Yeah, I, I bring that up because um, I went – Gosh, back in around 2011, I think I went and taught a little, a couple of classes on 4130, tick welding 4130 at, at Sun and Fun, which is sort of a very similar thing to Oshkosh. Yep. You know, and and uh, but I was I was sort of there under the Miller umbrella, and yep. uh, I bring that up because, gosh, there's still there's still people out there that that would argue that you shouldn't tick weld. Cr- 4130 chromoly they should be gas welded and it's a exactly. sort of a sort of a slam dunk at this stage of the game like if it's eighth inch and under you're cool to tig weld it without any preheat or post heat but there you got you got these old school people out there who don't believe that and still want to say you got to gas weld it and you got to post weld heat treat it and everything but i guess it's just fodder to further the i, I don't mind the discussion still going on but it's just kind of like how long is this going to go on like dude we, we've been tig welded We've moved past that, you know. <laughs> it can be <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very true. To that. That's that's fu- funny you brought that up because that's the whole thing I always remember is, young men, you probably don't even know what gas welding is, you know. <laughs> like, no, that's one one of the things we actually provide at the campus is we still want people to understand how to braze and oxy fuel weld and all that good stuff. And I, I, you know, I would get into those same talks with those gentlemen, you know, and I'd say, well, look at this, you know, we can take this piece of O20 aluminum. And we can just, you know, put a little bit of filler on it, dab it. We can polish it out. We're done, you know. And they're like, well, boy, that's that's amazing, you know. And, like, that's kind of how you would kind of show them just the advancement technology. And especially when inverter machines are, are, you know, really creeping and getting hotter more for these shows and people asking about them, it was neat to show the utilization of just the, the frequency with that, you know. Mm-hmm. All right. Yep. It's really – we take it for granted kind of as people who are kind of all-in people – to the welding, we know we know all about inverters and when they came on the scene and what they're good for and how how AC frequency and AC balance really has sort of you know come in there and changed the game a little bit. Not everybody necessarily understands all that. I mean, all of us do. I mean, but you know, there's still that argue. There's still the people out there arguing that you need to oxy fuel weld 4130 chromoly or it's going to be brittle and crack. You know, so it's yep. just a never ending education process i guess well it's just like all of us have undercut you know on social media you know <laughs> you post <laughs> yeah. a picture. it's like well, there's a shadow there no that's undercut you gotta go back and forth you know that's it's funny True. too because i kind of i kind of limit what i post you know and, and i'm one of the people too i got good welds and i got i got the crappy welds that get my job done through grease and paint and that's that is what it is you know but man you get some of those people it's like you sit there for 10 minutes trying to get a picture you're like okay how many people are going to complain about this one it's like it goes back to the gas <laughs> gas and fuel welding you know it's like man i'm over this stuff <laughs> explaining you know right yep yep what uh what kind of machine are you using in your home shop um home shop i for a while i had one of those uh 205 inverters but mainly what you see is my my big old monster 275 in the the back of my shop so that's something you know i've, I've always tried and true it loves eating my electricity bill but it's uh it's a good machine it's never let me down i think the first i've the first time it let me down was last year. I was welding a roll cage up for a side by side, and the lines were actually cracked from just sitting around at an old shop that I bought it from. And they went through all the water pump, and I went and bled a little bit of line out, a little air, and I had it too high up, and I, I blew out my actual heat exchanger in the back, so I had to get a new one. So for a machine I paid a couple grand for, that's made me you know tens of thousands of dollars. It's it's pretty funny that it has only cost me about five hundred dollars for maintenance for a mistake I actually did, and you know two hundred dollars for for new lines so that's a good machine you know i know there's a lot better out there but for what that's doing i, I never have any complaints with i hear you cool. you know I, I that little 205 v205 in that invertech two feet what is it called invertech 205 
something. Yeah, I think V V or something like that. Two hundred five V, two hundred five. I don't know, but that was that was uh, the first AC DC dual voltage machine that was on in the American market that I was aware of. Because when it came out, when it came out, I remember you know seeing it at a Fabtech at the Lincoln booth, and I'm like, okay, I was working with Delta at the time, and we did a lot of mobile welding where somebody'd have to go out to the aircraft hangar or out to the engine shop and make a a two minute weld that would take 15 minutes to haul the machine out there and stretch a 460 volt anaconda, you know, uh, cable to plug into to make a two minute weld. And so we're like, Oh, we got to have that. And it was a really good machine, but it did kind of a couple times get kind of glitchy where it would go into a pulse on pulse mode or something like that, you know, uh, go into a loop where you had to reboot it sort of. It was a really good machine other than, you know, you know, the normal glitches, but it was the first one that I was aware of that was, like I said, AC-DC dual voltage where you could run it off a 115-volt drop cord and, and, you know, get maybe 120 amps out of it, and, and that's more than enough for most most aircraft uh, repair wells that you needed to do in the hangar. So it was, it was a slam dunk for us. Well, Jesse, I want to talk to you about your shop. Because you work out of a shop very similar to all of us. And what impresses me about that is I'm looking at your picture, the bike that just won. That is incredible. Coming out of a small shop is what it is. So tell us what you have, where you work out of, and just go from there. We'll see where the conversation goes. (laughs) I think this will open up good. So, you know, anybody sees a big motorcycle shop, they're going to think dealership. You know, they think of a Harley dealer and what I have is I started out in a one-car garage. That, that building actually burned down about four years ago, and it was only a 20 by 20, and I had a mill, lathe. I had a bike lift. I mean, I crammed as much in there as I could that to the point I couldn't even squeeze a bike in there, and it's kind of one of those things that you work and work, and you kind of work yourself out of finally to you need to get a bigger space. So I was fortunate enough that my dad always let me rent out of that building. And before the fire, about a year before, we started uh, doing the, the barn you've seen before. It's got two-car garage. It's 30 by 40 feet. And we do one bike lift, and we have a big fab table, four by eight. And I always told myself, if, if I get bigger and I hire people on, I will definitely go you know, buy a building somewhere. But, yeah, that shop, it's funny how much we crank out and what we do for you know our annual sales and everything. It is just funny because it's still on my parents' property. I rent it out from them. And I've had people approach me and go, hey, man, how come you don't have a huge shop? Or, you know, for a guy who looks like he's you know, running a pretty big enterprise here, why are you doing it that way? I said, you know what, because it kind of gives you that family environment atmosphere, as funny as that sounds. But people feel safe and they feel a one-on-one connection. And I, I kind of like that way because I'm a worker. You guys are workers. And I love talking to people. But at the same time, I want to flip my hood down and I want to do my job. And, you know, I don't have time to sell T-shirts to people. I'd rather, you know, make parts and do stuff and that's kind of why I'm tucked away on five acres on a thousand foot long driveway. And I, I just always want to keep that as long as I can. And it's funny because everybody saw the Jesse James years and went, man, he's got a huge shop. It's, you know, 50 employees. And where did he end up back in Austin, Texas with a small little shop? You know, it's kind of neat because for years I wanted a big shop. And I go before even did that, I go, it makes sense to have that. You know, it lets you get your work done. And until you need bigger space, it's pretty much all you need to get a job done. Right. Yeah. I know. uh Isaac, I see Weld, he had stopped by your your place this past summer before he came to my house mm-hmm. and uh he was he was raving about your shop just like he's like, Man, that place is like a museum. It's it was <laughs> great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's cool. We have another building and uh that we were gonna put machines in again and stuff, the building that burned down, but it was a twenty by twenty and you know, I, I forgot it's got an overhang, so it was probably closer to probably like a forty five by by probably 30 once once you went outside of the building and i think my dad you know he went crazy we said hey man you should go a little bigger for yourself you're getting older you need like a cigar lounge kind of style place and so he goes well i'm gonna do the building 60 60 by like 40 and we're like holy crap dude you know so he he did it big but he's got half of it is literally just a cigar room and then the rest we never put any machines in i even sold all my mills off and stuff and we just store bikes in there and it does look like a museum. It's exactly what Isaac said. He goes, man, he goes, do you do anything in here in this building? I go, no, we just stare at stuff all day. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like my kind of place. Yeah. So. I used to smoke cigars. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had to promise my wife I'd, 
I'd quit, so I don't anymore. <laughs> but I really I'm enjoyed a, it. <laughs> I'm a connoisseur of pipe tobacco. That all started as a joke. So my grandfather smoked corn cob pipes, and if you recall, last December I had like that blast on Christmas Eve of all this, you know, smoking cigar pipe, and it was what it was, nothing else, you know. And I, I got full on Captain Black tobacco, and it just—it's nice at the end of the day. I'm not much of a, a huge smoker, but it's very nice to take the edge off like a cigar, you know. Mm-hmm. Right. I was going to ask you, what's your uh... Favorite type of pipe tobacco? Yeah, Captain Black, man. I I, I really dig that. I've, I've tried a few others, but that's that's like my go-to all the time. I kind of like that, and you know, I still new and kind of a, a green green behind the ears kind of guy with it. So I'm just still dabbling when I when I do get into it, it, you know. Right. Me too. I don't know anything about it. I'm still trying to research and learn and try different things, and it's like you never know until you try it. And it's, sometimes you get one, and it's like, whoa, no way, that's terrible. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> exactly. But, uh, yeah, no, it's cool. Well, you know, what we do at the shop is we're only, you know, we don't have cranes or anything to do big, big stuff, but it's enough, man, that we can get into a lot of trouble with all the jobs we bring in and, and what we do. And, you know, it's funny. I think I was 19 and did entrepreneur talk for a place that was local. And one of the guys knew us and he, he wasn't too much of a fan of what I did. He kind of didn't believe me. Cause he goes, Hey man, I kind of know what you're doing and seeing the caliber of bikes you want to achieve to build. And, I just don't know if you'll ever be able to do that kind of thing, you know. And he goes, you need a big facility and all this, blah, blah, blah. And I, I just couldn't believe it that, you know, because more square footage makes you more of a successful business person or a fabricator or welder, you know. <laughs> yeah. That's a, you know, if you saw Roy's uh, Roy's setup doing crummy welding in Tampa or you saw my setup and where I crank videos out or you, anybody. I think most people would be surprised and it just doesn't matter if you, you know, it just, if you got the basics, if you've got the tools and just enough space to do the thing, you can, you can get it done. You yep. don't have to, it doesn't have to look like it does on TV in order to get the work done. Exactly. Exactly. Well, that's one of the reasons I've always wanted to go up there. So for those that don't know, Jesse lives what, like an hour and a half, give or take away from me. And so it's always been a trip that I've wanted to make. But it's always inspiring to see what you kick out out of a, such a small shop, you know. And you're right. You don't have to have a multi-million dollar facility to make multi-millions of dollars. And that's kind of what I'm keeping reminding myself is I'm not the only one working out of a 24 by 32 shop. You know, I can do this for X amount of time and still make a living just like Jesse, you know, just like Roy and just like Jody and all these other people that we interview – that don't necessarily have you these huge shops, you know? Mm -hmm. Exactly. And that's, that's what I think keeps the bread and butter kind of of interest. You know, with what we do is, you know, my machinist is the same way. He's got a, a machine shop the size of a living room, you know, and the hot rod shop the same way. It's got enough to fit four cars in and that's pretty dang cool. You know, you just never, you just can't tell it. It, it makes no difference. The size of the shop, no. just the quality. It's just really the quality and the workmanship and the ingenuity and all that stuff that goes into it. My my machinist friend has a essentially a I guess you would call it a two car garage, detached garage. In that in that spot he has two CNC mills and a CNC turning center lathe and a manual lathe and a manual bridge port and he you know, it's all it's in a neighborhood. It's, it's not even in an industrial park. It's just in a neighborhood. And he's got probably half a million dollars or more worth of equipment in his detached garage. And he cranks out high quality work. Who, who cares that he's in a neighborhood? He, you know, the work speaks for itself. Exactly. And I, I think the one thing is, you know, I know Jonathan goes to a lot of places. And, and Roy, I, I, don't, I don't know what you guys have, you know, at the aircraft facility, but I've, I've been to frequented a few myself. And it is nice because, one, the cleanliness is amazing, you know, but. I know the one thing is I like the, the dirty, grungy job shops, you know, or production places. You know, we used to make some pretty big feed boxes for some place uh, out of a quarter-inch plate and three-eighths and half-inch, and it was cool, you know. And, but I think what's neat for me is I've, I've got to see a lot of different places, so I've got to see that part of it. It's almost like when people always say, I'd love to, love to own a Lamborghini. Well, it's like maybe drive one for half a day and see if you actually really like it or if it just that, that kind of excitement feeling wears off and you go, okay, cool, it's just another car, you know, and that's – that's what I would always suggest to anybody listening to this is go frequent a place if you can and, and try some tools and stuff. And you realize it's not really worth achieving that that level you need for a shop. And just just go with what you need to make something successful, you know. Right. What um just 
kind of change gears a little bit, but what would you say is your favorite type of work to do? We'll, we'll start off generic. I, I like I like anything with TIG welding. Um, I think I would say, and it, it's a it's a creative one is building chassis. I used to be, you know, when I would make my own sheet metal stuff, though, that was really fun too because you're taking a flat blank, you thought of all the stuff to to make this three dimensional piece and. That was really cool, but after we built so many, it was like, okay, that's that's all right, you know. But that will be coming full swing around because soon enough we'll be doing a lot of body panels at the one shop. So, you know, going from gas tanks and fenders is so so, but doing a whole car body in pieces that's pretty impressive, you know. But I would say frames, you know, anything with with tubing and geometry and the cuts and man, when you when like me, I'm OCD. I do all the right hand side of my frames. I do my my right hand. And then everything on the left hand side, I will you know switch over to my left hand, so everything's following the same way, the same heat input, and the same pulling with distortion. And I just I just love doing chassis. There's something about it, you know. That's pretty cool. I couldn't imagine trying to form up all the panels for a whole car. I'd be lost on that one. <laughs> yeah, it's like you see all these incredible people on social media. You see the the wooden bucks for a whole car, you know, and it's like holy crap that's that's insane to me you know to just where do you start and you know and how do you form it and make it perfect where it just needs paint on it and no body filler yeah that that's yeah. definitely not in my realm <laughs> <laughs> yeah yep so on the flip side of that what's your least favorite uh definitely we do some work at a company that does the raw material that makes textiles so insulation like the pink roll stuff you see mm. and they have a very very nasty glue that i'm talking if you're grinding you see that one little spark that shoots maybe 10 more feet than the others it's like that stuff is up in flames you know so you always have a fire watch and it's, it's kind of rough stuff but that's crazy because once you roll on that it's like when people complain doing carpentry with insulation that's that's pretty pretty rough nasty stuff a lot of it is easy stuff but you know it's once you get that grinder to kick it up or an air nozzle or you you know you're trying to clean stuff off and we just fixed a part. I posted it um, last week. If you guys saw me laying down on the railroad ties where they got the cart going, that had about four inches of this glue on it. We got it out of the way, but it just sticks to everything. You know, it's, it's almost like spider web, you know, but just it's so so gnarly to weld on, you know. Ugh. It reminds me of when I worked on boats, you get that fiberglass all over you. Mm -hmm. Oh, man, this stuff gets in yeah. your arms and stuff, and it just never comes out. <laughs> Probably still have yeah, we... shards of it in my arm. <laughs> exactly the the worst ones and they always say in this I, I don't teach the pipe welding at the college you know it's something i i used to do a little bit of uh back in the day in, in my earlier 20s but i don't do much now um but man doing those real welds in, in out there and you're doing repairs and it's four inches off the ground with a mirror and you're in a, in a quarter inch or half inch of water you know or it's trickling in a boiler system it's pretty nasty that kind of stuff but it sets the whole new tone that Anything on a bench or anything that was easy, you thought learning, it was a whole new game. Just trying to get something that's solid and be able to, you know, be X-rayed and, and quality stuff. You know. Yeah, really. <laughs> At the same time, too, you get slightly used to doing those crazy out of position welds, and then you go and you work on a bench somewhere, and it's like, huh, this is easy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're like, that was only a 12-hour day. That's no problem. You know, you do the other stuff, you're like. Holy cow, I've been here for an hour. I'm tired already. <laughs> yeah. It's like, my back hurts. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It, well, to not linger on, but the worst one I ever did was a garbage compactor. And oh. uh, I took a fiberglass blanket in there, and I lay down, and I'm looking underneath this thing, and I, I'm literally seeing old condoms, and I've seen syringes in the corner. And then I remember the one thing that made me happy was seeing a Starburst wrapper. I was like, oh, my God, happy thoughts, you know. But that was <laughs> that was, that was was gnarly, man. That was like, I don't ever want to do this again. And there was about six inches to weld in because one of the pins wore out and triangulated the, the hole that the pin slid through. And, man, I just I couldn't get out of that thing. That was like a nine-hour job. And I just like, man, if I ever catch something I don't want, it's going to be in this compactor, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so – the mood changer in the work day was seeing a Starburst wrapper instead of condoms. <laughs> I'm eccentric. Let's just, I'm like, at least let that settle in. Here. Let's that settle. Let that sink in just a little. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm weird with that kind of stuff, but yeah, I need to do that. Cause I'll be like, you know what? This ain't enough money. I'm out of here. <laughs> so star Starbucks helped me get through the day. Yeah. Or the, oh, the Starburst. My bad. I used to I used to fabricate these little sewer tractors, these remote control sewer 
they were fiber optic camera, you know, little tractor module things and fabricating them was a breeze, but you know, several times a year, they the used ones would come in for repair that had been down in the sewers. And, you know, <laughs> that was just awesome smelling that stuff, <laughs> you know, <laughs> grooving out cracks and the, ah, man, I don't know what kind of, Sifagana herpy hiv I'm driven breathing <laughs> here. <laughs> you know? Exactly. Should be the name of this but, episode. Yeah. <laughs> Sifagana herpy hiv. Got a sip of herpa crap. That'll be the title of this one. Be like, wow, that, that raw iron guy is really weird, man. <laughs> yeah, I know. But you know, but, we do what we do what we got to do. You just hold your breath sometimes, you know. <laughs> yeah, and and that's the thing is if if I could suggest to anybody is from outside even being an instructor, but just a welder is people see all the flashy bikes and they go, oh, man, you must just build bikes your whole life. And I just laugh sharing these stories with like you guys because it really sets the tone where, where I worked my way to go up because it even was money that I put back to invest in my own company. And, you know, people go, oh, just you must have just gradually got into it. It's like, no, this was horrible, man. There's times that I was in those compactors or confined areas and, you know, I mean, smashing 300-pound beams on my hands and, and getting stitched up. And it's that's what made me a welder today, and people need to always remember that, you know. For sure. Yep. It, it ain't all, it ain't all rainbows and unicorns. You know, some, yep. some days are really awesome. You know, you get to weld on clean stuff and you get to stack dimes and you know, all that. And that makes you feel really great. And that's what you live for. But other days you're like, you know, you wouldn't post those wells on Instagram in a million years, but you're still proud of them because you got them done in the crappiest of conditions, you know, and, and you got the job done and made a paycheck and got on to the next thing. That's part of it. That's really a very big part of it as as a welder. You you take the good with the bad. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I'm always curious with uh, all of our guests and all, with building choppers and things in your home shop, what would you say is your like go-to tool that you always have next to you, basically? Hmm. Well, and you guys are going to know this. I would say a Sharpie. I mean, it, it's, it's a, it's a basic one, you know, but you know, that's the, the lesser of the, the question I guess I got to answer to you is, you know, that Sharpie, you can never have enough of them in a shop and layout and everything from sketching to getting that right, you know, but I think my go-to tool, man, would always be, and this is going to be funny being a welding thing, but as a grinder, you know, I mean, for field stuff and in my shop, I'll always a grinder, anything from finishing stuff to cutting stuff facing it whatever it may be you know that's that's always one that you always at least for myself i need a grinder you know it's it's my bread and butter next to my welder and uh the sharpies and the scales and all that stuff and it's it's kind of basic and bland but that's that's that, that's what keeps me rolling as a grinder you know oh yeah what kind of sharpies do you like do you like the little fine tip ones or just the regular sharpies i like those fine tips it's kind of like when you go out and say you're gonna have one drink at first you're like wow this is really fun we're having a good time then all of a sudden you know like 12 swipes later you know that sharpie's all blunt and bland and that's kind of how you feel after those drinks when you said you'd have one or three you know and uh that's kind of you know with me i like sharpie they're okay for basic layout but rough surfaces or anything like that i kind of tended to fall in love with those new milwaukee ones you know those those red ones that they say can go over grease and oil and any of those surfaces and they, they last pretty dang long you know and the tips even with you know withstand a lot of abuse and they're just a little pricey, but they're definitely ones that I, I like and kind of always keep one in my pocket if I know I'm going to be on a pretty rough surface. Yeah, I was at my last job, we had the fine tip Sharpie markers in the little vending machine, and that's what we used for laying out everything. It makes a huge difference. You know, you lay down just a nice fine line, and that's all you need. You use those big old, I usually start calling them dollies. Because the tip gets all, like you said, all gnarled up and everything, and you lay yep. a quarter-inch fat line, and it's like, well, somewhere in there it'll be right, I guess. <laughs> you know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I, I agree with you. You know, a, a good marking tool is very, very important. Spe yeah, I mean, yep. fabricating something. My, my buddy, actually, I built that bike for that one uh, this evening. It, it's comical, but he's like, man, you got to have a pen on you. And, you know, I'm always have, a, you know, two pens and I always have three Sharpies. I have the dull beat up one. I have one in between and then I always have a brand new one. And it seems dumb, but, you know, you, you are laying things out. I never know what I'm doing. And, you know, it, it's so basic to ask a guy who builds bikes and all this stuff and the equipment we have. And, you know, what's your favorite you know tool? What's one you like in the Sharpie? But if I didn't have that, I mean, 
I, it's really my my first go to thing that I need for any layout, and it's it's comical, but that's that dollar sharpie saves my life, you know. Oh yeah, I know my my wife would laugh if she heard me say it, but I wear those uh, Duluth Trading pants, the cargo pants, all the time. Uh, thanks to Joel over at Overkill, he got me hooked on those things. But I always have my flashlight pen, uh, a regular pen, and I used to always keep a, a Sharpie in there too. So I'm right there with you. I know the feeling. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, it's all depends what you need beyond that for what other tools. But that, that's a trusty one. What? advice would you give somebody that's either getting into the trade or wanting to go out maybe try to build their own chopper or own motorcycle frame or something i would say first if you're if you're getting into it ask questions and that's a hard part you know in this in this field there's people that want to share knowledge like us for and there's the people that totally just want to clam up and keep all that little bit of information they think they're very good at you know and they may know a few things but they really don't but they want to clam up and not tell anybody and that kind of discourages people. So I always tell them, hey, if someone kind of gives you the boot and tells you, hey, get out of here, I don't want you here, and no, I'm not going to help you, you know, in any way, keep asking questions, you know. Shoot shoot my, myself, you know, uh, a message on Instagram or you guys, you know, and like how Jody, you know, is always open with the people commenting and messages or, hey, email me. And that's that's where I think the first place starts is the positivity, you know, get someone interested into it. Um, with bike stuff, it's always educate yourself. Don't when I started this, guys, I, I thought I was going to just be kicking ass and taking names. And if I could tell you how much I learned even from the last bike I built for Sturgis and so, stuff I even make for a customer bike, I'm I'm always learning and I'm not trying to rush to get something done, especially at the short deadlines. I'm always thinking, you know, I've, I've got that aha moment at four in the morning and I jump up and go, that will work. But I try never to box myself into a corner and, and that's what I can suggest to people is don't jump into it thinking you're going to kick its ass it's you got to really step back think about it ask questions you know and look at it is is everything in this world is a center line a straight line a circle a square and a triangle and if you're going to attempt making a tank or a frame look at it that way you know don't get overwhelmed either and don't get discouraged by it as well sounds good was there any advice that was given to you in the past that really helped you become yeah. the fabricator that you are today absolutely um People let me stand there and watch them. I know, you know, being an educator, you have uh, individuals who are very good at, you know, audio. There's also visual. You know, you get a lot of people who are good at reading a, an instruction manual or a book, and they will remember word for word. I am not one of those people. I am, like, hooked on phonics special. If I want to know how to spell cat, I need to see the cat first, you know. And it was always been that way. And, you know, when I, when I, I, I kind of look at it as people that let me stand there and watch them was the best lesson. And, you know, they would tell you, here's where you could mess up and here's where you can you know, succeed at this part. So I had that. But I also had a few people that did give me the boot. And even even down to, you know, events like this weekend, there's still people that have animosity of what we're doing and what I've what I've done. And who knows why and who cares why, you know, but that kind of fuels me in both ways. And, you know, that's that's kind of why I share that on don't get discouraged as well. But, you know, that's just my take on the things. Sounds good. So, Jesse. Where do you see yourself in the coming years with your business, with your life, with or where do you want to be? Uh, this, this is a good question, so cut me off if it goes too long. Um, the, the first one is we're, we're always looking to grow. I think kind of for me the three- to five-year plan is I will expand raw iron. You know, there's only so many man hours I have. I know, I know you guys have kids of your own and a family, and I do not. Just kind of took the role of my family and kids at the moment is my motorcycle company, and you know, until lately, you know, you realize your other half needs you more than those motorcycles need you in your business. And for me, I'm looking at expanding my company where I could hire two or three employees. And being an educator, I know what quality I could build as even being a trainer. So I would love to still do motorcycles, do that part for myself and, you know, have a crew of guys that could fabricate and do stuff at a small scale and kind of expand raw iron. And that's kind of kind of a dream that's not even on paper yet. And it's just kind of been swung around there, you know, and so to tell you the truth, it, it's very strange, but raw iron, I never thought would be at this point where I'm having a conversation with people I've looked up to for years like Jody, you know, and uh, individuals who really helped me out there and, and people I followed and, and really admire. And for me, I, I, I looked at it as I was I would learn a trade, I would become a welder, and I wouldn't be someone who ever made it on a cover of a magazine or, or TV, even though I aspired to. So sitting back now, I'm going, hey, man, do I want to keep working 100 hours a week and 
you know, deadlines. And if you guys recall in the summertime, I mean, we built two bikes in three months and, you know, my one bike was built in six weeks from scrap tubing on the floor bundled up to a finished fired bike on, you know, within six weeks. And, you know, there's a point when, you know, when you're with somebody and I don't have children yet, but they'll need me more than, you know, if I'm selfish to something like that. So to get all serious and things like that, I'm at the other spectrum where I, I have a goal for raw iron, but when business is kind of smoothly going, I'm going to focus on a little bit more personal life. So I kind of know how to work hard and play hard because I've definitely worked hard and, you know, you kind of lose a lot of that time. You need to make sure you don't lose too much of it. Right, man. That's preach, preach brother. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, know? you know, you got to have some balance here and there. Every nothing can be perfectly balanced in life, but you got to correct here and there and, and uh, devote time to where you've been lacking here and there and, can't get anything out of balance too far for too long, but I, I under, totally get it. I totally get it. Yeah, and that's that's the one for me, guys. I mean, you guys have been following me for years, and I've always had late hours, and you guys are late hour, you know, kicking ass and taking the world's name, you know, by storm. And it's it's something, you know, when we built our first bike for TV in five weeks, I never thought I could do that. I told my whole crew we can do this, but every night I was sitting there it was like a general war, not knowing if I'd lose my whole my whole you know brigade the next day, and. Um, I, I pushed through it and I learned that, hey, if I keep putting my nose to the grind and I can do this, but it's almost like a drug addiction. You guys know that you can work so hard and when the money keeps coming in and, you know, you're on to that next you know win. And especially with these shows, the winning and attention, the media, you, you tend to lose grasp of the important things. And kind of when my best friend passed away two years ago, that set the tone. I mean, you go back to taking it for granted when they ask you, will you get a sandwich with me? And they understand you're busy. But, you know, when you're carrying his coffin into the, mo- you know, in, into his little you know, like tomb, you kind of go, man, I, I should have spent a little more time with that person. Or, you know, even my girlfriend and I, we've been together for 10 years and we lived together the last four. And there's so much we've evolved and changed from. And it's like, you know, for me, it's like I got to I got to look forward to the next part of family. And it's it's weird as a welding talk. You know, we're going through this, but it's you know, we're, we're discussing this. But I look at it as when you read a motivational book, you never get the part of the hard days. You didn't want to get out of bed the days you were sick. And they never tell you what happens when you do get to the top, you know, and, and the top doesn't mean you made a million and it doesn't mean you're on tabloids. It just means you're satisfied where you're at and no one tells you what's, what's your next move or your personal life as well. You know, yep. they come to a point where you kind of got to figure out what, what success means to you and, uh, where you draw the line between dollars in the bank and quality of life and relationships and all that stuff. And no one can really, define that but Mm -hmm. you you know and uh yeah and you got to sort of do a little gut check and figure out where you want to be yep and and not to you know to wrap this up not to you know get anybody flustered or say hey i don't want to be like those guys they sound like they're tired and worn out it's it's very much worth it once you can get control of it you know the pros and cons um but you will definitely give you would dedicate and do the blood sweat and tears theory as hard as you can and we all did it and i think that is what what will make you successful and learn a craft. I mean, you know, I look at myself and I'm I'm privileged to work with some people that have triple the experience in years with me and they, they trust me working with them. And it's because I always ask that question, why? And, uh, they, they helped me through life and said, told me the same thing. Don't work too hard. Don't do things wrong. Don't half ass it and, uh, give 110%, you know, and once had someone tell me there's no such thing as 110%. I said, yeah, it is. I said, the 10% is when you get up early, you're there on time and you're pushing the broom. That's the ten percent that's not paid for, but it actually it actually has a better chain reaction for success, you know. Well, that seems like a good place to put a pin in it because that is so true. That ten percent are the intangibles. You know, you can only obviously you can only give a hundred percent. People talk about giving one hundred and ten, one hundred fifty, two hundred percent. There's only hundred percent, but there's stuff there's stuff that is uh, done around the peripherals, like you said, cleaning the toilet or pushing a broom that doesn't seem to be part of the 100%, so you'll put it in the 110% range. But it's still very much a part of success, you know, because who's going to clean the toilet if you don't, you know? And then that's just kind of – it's kind of like sets the tone for that you're going to do whatever it takes. If you're going to clean the toilet, if you're going to get up early and show up early, that just sort of like sets the tone. Like that, there's a a famous Navy SEAL who gives a talk about getting up and making your bed. Make your bed. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it's a very famous speech, but it's a it sets the tone for the day and it it sets the tone for your life. And uh, little things, little hinges swing big doors. Exactly. Exactly. And that's 
that's the most important thing. That's one thing I've always taught, you know, raised is I was blessed to get into this, this field and do what I do and, you know, have a, a, a small little following. And I always, I always think of the person who has to wash the trays at a fast food joint or, you know, has to clean that toilet and, you know, do the best you can. And that's why, like, if I try to do something even small, I, I, it's not below me. You know, I don't think I'm better. I, my girlfriend even makes fun of me. I, I, I clean the toilet. Like you could literally eat a sandwich off of it. And she's like, why do you go so crazy? I go, I just, I just mildly have OCD, but also I just, I don't know how to do something just 80%. I just try to give it what I can, you know? Yeah. There you go, man. Well, one final question, Jesse, what do uh-huh. you like to do outside of building choppers and work? Gotcha. That's the good question. Um, honestly, socialize, if that's, that's one thing that sounds kind of, kind of petty, you know, is I, I spent a lot of time in my shop, my, my, by myself, you know, when I was in my, my later teens and my early twenties. And I had a few friends who would hang out with me cause they were work obsessed and we all like, you know, working and tinkering around. And I, I kind of like, you know, going out and having a drink or having a cigar, or, you know, a little bit of pipe tobacco. And, you know, that's, that's one thing I really like is taking the time to, you know, I had a, a gentleman one time from North Carolina tell me, he goes, Jesse, he goes, I love the inspiration. I love your, your work ethic is being a 20 year old kid, but he goes, don't, don't get too old too soon. He goes, you're like an old soul, man. He goes, try to go have some fun. So, you know, that's something I like doing is socializing with people and hanging out at the shop and, you know, just beyond that, man, um, riding bikes. That's, that's probably my biggest thing is I, you know, I build these things and I, I build them to ride. And I like taking time now. We got a, a touring bike. My girlfriend and I go on, and that's something this year we're doing is we're actually just going to go plane jet, um, and we're gonna, just going to go fly around the country. We're going to go see California, and we want to we want to go have some fun and you know kind of just lay lay back. You know, we you look at all of us guys, we're always on the road and we're always you know social, but you know it's it's kind of nice to take some time to just kind of kick back a little bit. And I'm kind of boring like that, you know. Nothing boring about that. Yeah, so, but yeah. yeah, besides that, man, same old stuff, you know, four-wheelers, dirt bikes, snowmobiles, you know, it's things you can get on, get in trouble with and set things on fire, you know, we uh, we sure know how, how to have a good time like that, you know, but that's just kind of the generic stuff everyone gets into, you know, a little bit outside of, besides socializing, what I like to do, you know, for fun. Sounds good. Sounds good. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Was there anything else that you want to add? No, man, I just, you uh, really appreciate you guys you know having me on and you know definitely an honor and it's it's cool and i guess the one thing i could leave here is uh it's always comical because people always talk about jody and my my classes my my younger students who are very savvy on the internet they go man this guy is like a wizard with welding he's got all this information and dude you, one day you should teach like this guy and stuff and uh, they have no <laughs> idea that jody and i mutually know each other and then one day i remember jody it was probably a year ago when i was in bike week he goes Man, he goes, I'm jealous. I, I, I want some of that sandwich, you know. And my students that were in that class, because I had time off, it must have been a, a day or day after we, we had, you know, a class that my substitute was covering. And they go, you know Jody? Holy crap. And I'm like, yeah, I'm like, he's, he's a normal person, guys. But they think he's like Superman. It's it's awesome. I mean, I, I laugh really hard because they're like, I can't believe you know him. Like, you know, like you even have his phone number. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah, guys. It, it's I'm like we're, we're welders. That's what we just do. Tell you them, know, but just tell them everything <laughs> looks better on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But but they they do look up to you, man. And that that's cool to me because, you know, it, they'll say, hey, this is something Jody shared in the video. And, you know, how come you don't do it this way? Or what do you suggest with that? And, you know, and it, it's neat because, you know, Jody, you, you've rarely set a, a tone for individuals to they can trust and rely on your information and. Even myself at times, you know, I'm looking up some online and you're, you know, you're the first three searches on my search engine and that's, that's pretty cool, man. So, I mean, keep doing what you're doing. It's always been a pleasure, you know, talking with you and Jonathan and, and Roy, I, I haven't met in person, you know, and it's, it's good because we're just real down to earth, you know, and I think that's what really attracts the public to, to talking with us and, you know, us passing our information on to them, you know. That's really cool. I mean, obviously no one knows everything and so we just try to share what our perspective our point like i'm I'm sure in the way i do things and i don't do not mind at all if somebody comes in and chimes in and says yeah that's fine but i do it this way and that's how we all learn i I remember when i was in school i had two instructors it was super beneficial to watch one and then watch the other give you a demo because one of them would click with you and one of them wouldn't necessarily so that's the way life is you know somebody uh, not everybody's way will work with you, so, but I mean, if it gets the conversation started, then it's all good. Exactly, and that's that's funny you bring that up because my mentor is 
now the, the guy I work with. And, uh, you know, I'm second command from him at the local community college and along with two other instructors. And it's, it's very neat because I get people all the time and go, well, Ryan does it this way. You do it this way. And then they'll actually call us out to try to get us to almost argue about who's the better welder, who has a better technique. And, you know, it comes down to information we share. But we're like, guys, there's a couple of different ways to skin a cat. You know, we're just showing you what fits in your groove the best. And you're absolutely right. Like two instructors is incredible. And my students never come back and say, well, I like you more than him. You know, they always come down with, man, I, I got a little bit of this from you and a little bit from him. And, you know, I'm combining these to kind of make make my own flow. And, you know, that's that's very beneficial. Like you said, two instructors is very cool if you have that opportunity. Mm hmm. Where could our listeners find you online or on Instagram? Well, they can find me on uh, Facebook. Obviously, just go to the search bar. It is Raw Iron Choppers. And Instagram is at Raw Iron Choppers as well. Our website is rawironchoppers.com. And uh, I'll tell you guys what, I mean, any of the listeners, um, if you have questions, anything like that, you know, regarding even welding or if you're local in the Ohio area, northeast, um, and we can help you out with any type of classes in the community college or even one-on-one at Raw Iron. You know, we can do that, too. And, you know, feel free. You know, if it, it takes me a little bit sometimes to get back to people, but I am more than happy to converse. And, you know, I'm never one to shun anybody away as long as it's not negative on, on you know, the social media feeds or even emails. So, you know, even my shop phone is my mobile. So I even text a lot of my customers. And, you know, I'm always there to be able to get her in reach of, you know. Sounds good. Awesome. Very, very generous of you to give that information out. Appreciate it, guys. Well, I, I really do. I'm, I'm happy we could sync this up finally because I know I was kind of the pain with certain days and things we could do and couldn't do. So, you know, happy it worked, uh, you know, driving 400 miles home from Chicago and I'm 80 right now. Well, we're, we're <laughs> glad to have served the purpose of at least keeping you awake for about an hour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Keeping you out of the ditches. No, exactly. it was a pleasure. Pleasure having you, Jesse. I mean, you uh, you shared freely with information, and that's always awesome, an awesome thing. I think all of us definitely look up to you and the quality of work you put out, and how freely you share information, and the fact that you're a the fact the fact that you're a welding instructor as well as entrepreneur, chopper builder, motorsports guy, whatever is just a uh, you know, you're just the kind of guy we want to have on that, that shares oh, information you. and just all all in like we are. Yeah, thank you. Well, it's, it's very inspirational seeing the three of you and especially, you know, being friends with you, you know, outside of social media and within. It's 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 very, very cool to see what you're doing and pushing. And I, I really highly respect that, you know, especially getting to know Jonathan. I remember uh, Jonathan came out to my dad at a show probably three or four years ago. And he goes, hey, this this guy, Jonathan, uh, uh, came up and he's, you know, he goes from Superior Welding. And I, I had a card and everything. I'm like, who is this guy? I'm trying to figure it out. And it's cool to now have the relationship with Jonathan to just know how much impact he as well is, you know, sharing with everybody with, you know, his welding knowledge, you know? Yeah. It's cool how it all works when it, when it works, it's cool when it works. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> if every, so if everybody kind of works together and shares and keeps things positive, it is really, it, it can become something really cool. That's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Well, this is what it's all about. And thanks for listening to me babble and having, having me on your guys' deal, you know, man, thanks for being on Jesse. Absolutely. No problem. All right, as we bring another episode to a close, we'd like to once again thank all those that support the podcast, especially our top patrons. This month, we'd like to thank James Greer, Brian Young, Anthony Chrysomalis, Smith Industries, Michael Menz, Andy Hunter, Veteran Welding Co., Yusuf Khan, Andy Katonic, Black Sheep Fab Shop, Scott Tasso, Weldy McWelds, Richard Black, Mike Howe, James Yoakum, Eric Rupel, Thor Goodmanson, No San Juan, Shane Gunnan, Rick Alato, Jacob Elder, SNS Metal Fab, and House of Chop. Man, that list is getting long, and we very, very much appreciate that. If you'd like to support the podcast, head on over to patreon.com forward slash welding tips and tricks podcast. And if you'd like to reach us here at the podcast, our email address is weldingtipsandtrickspodcast at gmail.com. And if you'd like to leave us a voicemail, our phone number is 915-308-7024. And I'm Roy Crumrine. I'm Jody Collier. I'm Jonathan Lewis. This is Jesse from Raw and Choppers, and that's a wrap. Perfect. That was, that was an excellent episode. Absolutely. Cool, cool. A lot I got, of... I got, I got a little scared. I was just going over a bridge. You guys started breaking up, and... I kind of paused. I'm like, I hope this stops breaking up. And then it came back. Well, you be safe going home. We'll do, guys. We'll do. And, and thank you. And, you know, thanks for the interest. And really appreciate it.
just holler. You know, if you guys are in the neck of woods, you know, you're always more than welcome to swing by. Cool, awesome. man. Sounds good. We'll That's be in touch. Cool. All right, Will drive. do. All right, guys. Talk drive to you safe. Soon. Yep. Will do. Thank you. Bye-bye.